Right. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 13. And uh, I just want to make mention again for the recording for you folks that are online now and maybe watching this after the event. Unfortunately, we've had some issues with the microphone that doesn't normally connect into the system and we have done everything possible. But for some odd reason, it's just not connecting this morning. So we have gone with our plan B mic. And you folks are getting the plan A mark that are here. So I'm, I trust you can all hear me clearly. And uh, well, we're here to study God's word. It is important that we study the word of God and not just glibly read through it. The word of God says very clearly in 2 Timothy 2.15, study, study. The reason we study is so that we can get the word of God effectually working in us. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 tells us that. It is important we do this. So, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to be reading from verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're going to be reading from verse 1. Paul the Apostle writes and he says to Timothy, um, a young pastor who he is encouraging, and he's in essence going to hand over the baton to, because he knows his life is coming to an end, and He's encouraging Timothy. Second Timothy is the last book of the Bible that was written. It's not the last book in the Bible, but it is the last book, I believe, that was written to complete the canon of Scripture. And Paul the Apostle writes and he says, Thou therefore, my son, that's Timothy, he wasn't his biological son. He was, he considered him his son-in-law. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must first be partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say. I love what Paul says to Timothy. Consider what I say. To listen very carefully. Hear me. Consider what I say. And the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evil doer, even unto bonds. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Father God, as we consider your word to our hearts this morning, as we read through this, believe it, we know that it will effectually work in us as we trust your word. And may you teach us what you would have us to know today. In and through Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Right, so this morning my message is entitled, He Cannot Deny Himself. Paul the Apostle, um, speaking to Timothy, writing to Timothy, and right at the end he says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Notice, the Lord Jesus Christ not won't deny himself, he cannot deny himself. The character of God is such that God cannot deny himself. And this is what I want us to look at this morning. And I'm going to bring us to a, um, through some scriptures where we look at what Peter was doing when Christ Jesus was um, arrested. Then there's some things that I want to share with you. I said to you last week that there are some thoughts on what Peter did and what he said that I just want to share with you. Let me just bring something. There's a verse that sometimes brings a bit of confusion, and that is um, 2 Timothy 2.12. I don't want to teach the whole lesson on this this morning, but just it says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. That's not denying who Christ is. If you get in the context, it's suffering with him. It's being willing to carry the cross, be, be burdened for the gospel. And, and in other words, the denial there is if you're not going to suffer with Christ, if you're not going to fulfill what the word of God requires of us to go out there and share the word of God, live godly in the way that we need to be uh, ambassadors and examples, we're going to be denied the reward. It's got nothing to do with being denied your salvation. 
Okay, I just want to bring that. We will do a teaching on that. We are we have gone through this in the Bible studies. You can get the Bible study notes and the audio clip on that where I shared that very thing on that verse. So I don't want to reteach it and take away from what I want to say today, but I just want to bring that in because it is something that people say, well, what do you mean? You know, Jesus is going to deny me? No. The point I want to bring out here is he cannot deny himself. Now, having said that, go with me. Let's have a look at the promise Peter makes to the Lord Jesus Christ. So go with me to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. And Alice, uh, I know you're outside checking the sound. Can you just come and give me a thumbs up just to settle in my mind that you can hear me, although maybe not 100% clearly. Thank you. <laughs> Alice is our sound technician sitting outside making sure. So thank you. Oh, uh, boy. No, it's, it, uh, sorry, guys. It's just on my mind, and uh, at least I know you folks online, I'm you know, you can hear me. That's the most important thing. Not that you can hear me, the most, the most important thing. Just read the scriptures. Matthew 26, verse 13. Matthew 26, verse 13. Right. Now, I want to encourage you, and when we give you the scriptures, and I know there are a number of you that do this, when I say to you, Matthew 26, and we read from verse 30 to 35, go and actually read the whole chapter if you can through the week and just get the flow of it. Matthew 26, verse 30. Story of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, um, we're just going back and he's, he's going to be arrested and he's going to be brought before um, the, the high priest. And there's just a couple of things happening. But I just want to pick up on certain things here. Verse 30. And when they had sung in him. Oh, boy. I don't know, that we, we just sung two songs. You folk online with us and those over here. When they had sung a him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Then said Jesus unto them, all ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, notice, though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, This night, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise, also said all the other disciples. Notice, it was, you know, there's this thing that, well, Peter, Peter said he wouldn't deny Christ. The other disciples said, we'll stand with you. We're with you, Lord. We're with you. Don't worry. We're going to be with you. The problem is, and I just want to bring this right out in the beginning, is the disciples did not fully understand what the Lord Jesus Christ was accomplishing. In their mind, Christ was coming to set up a kingdom. He was coming to sort out the nation of Israel, and he was going to come and sort out all their problems. And you're going to see as this thing unfolded how it is my contention. I'll just say this right up front. Many folks have said that Peter was a coward. And I've heard that said so often. And a number of years ago, I heard someone teach on the fact that he did not believe Peter was a coward. And I've been looking into that. And I've come to that same understanding. I don't believe Peter was a coward. I believe Peter was disheartened. At the events and what was happening and confused. And therefore, which led him to deny that he knew the Lord. Not deny who Christ was, but deny that he knew the Lord. So go with me to Zechariah 13, where the Lord Jesus Christ, remember, the reason why we study the scriptures here, the reason why we take scripture upon scripture and not just me telling you some story, is we need to understand the Lord Jesus Christ always used scripture. Notice when he says um, in verse 31, Then Jesus said unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. I mean, what was Christ just making that up? No. Go with me to Zechariah chapter 13. Zechariah chapter 13. Zechariah 13 verse 7. When the Lord says it is written, he was referring to scripture. Zechariah 13 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts, smite the shepherd and the sheep 
shall be scattered. And I will turn my hand upon the little ones. There we go. The Lord Jesus Christ quoting scripture. Do you know that the Lord Jesus Christ knew scripture like the back of his hand? He had studied scripture. We, we hear the story when he was 12 years old. Um, he was already discussing it with the religious leaders. And they were, the Bible says, were astounded at, at his knowledge of the word of God. Remember something. The Lord Jesus Christ was always fully God, but he was also man. In his humanity, he needed to study the scriptures. In his humanity, he needed to rest, just like you and I. In his humanity, he needed to eat to sustain his physical body. In his humanity, he had emotion. The word of God said, Christ wept at the grave of Lazarus. So we, when we, we, we think of this, it, it may be a bit difficult for us to say, but how can he be fully God and fully man and be subject to all of these things? Well, that is exactly what God Almighty was accomplishing through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to bring God and man together in Christ. Now, so Peter makes a promise. He says, Lord, even if everybody denies you, I'm not going to deny you. And the other disciple comes up. Us too. You ever had anybody say, don't worry, I've got your back. And then when you look around and you really need them, where are they? Gone. I've got your back. Well, can I tell you, the Lord Jesus Christ has got your back. He's got your life. And that's what we need to be understanding here. Go with me to the book of John chapter 18. So think about this. Let's go, go with me to John chapter 18. I'm fascinated by this. These guys, they really, and that's why I say, I don't believe Peter was a, a coward. Peter, Peter was ready to stand for the Lord. But when things didn't go quite the way he thought they should go, but I bet I'll copy one expression. What no? <laughs> You know, what happens now? John 18, John 18, verse 3. John 18, verse 3. Judas, then having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Judas was the one that betrayed Christ. Judas... It, might, it is my understanding, and, and you're free to disagree with me, it is my understanding that Jews, Judas, boy oh boy, he knew how to pray. For three and a half years, he was with the Lord, and, you know, none of the other disciples picked up on the fact that he, he, he was going to deny the Lord. He didn't just wake up one morning and say, okay, well, you know, the scriptures say that someone's going to deny the Lord. And, oh, well, let me just do it. No, no, Judas's heart was not after the things of God. His heart was after the... Right. Jesus, Jesus, verse 4, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things, underline that, Jesus, what? Knowing all things. How did he know all things? Well, God his Father and God the Holy Spirit, you know, Christ spends so much time in prayer with his Father. Can you imagine the, 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 the discussions going, Lord, I've looked at your, Father God, I've looked at your word, I know that what is required of me, I know exactly what I must do. Christ Jesus knew that. That's why the book of Hebrews says, for the joy that was set before him, Christ endured the cross, despising the shame. How did he know that? Well, he looked at the scriptures and he knew what he had accomplished. He brought his humanity in line with his deity. He was sinless in every way. They answered him, verse 5, Jesus said, they answered him and he says, I beg your pardon. He says, whom seek you? Verse 4. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus said unto him, I'm he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. Think of that. And as soon then as they had said unto them, I'm he, notice they went backward and fell on the ground. I mean, it's you? you the one we're coming to arrest. Then he asked them again, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Notice, he cannot deny who he is. He didn't say, well, I don't know. You know, it's like someone coming after you said, who did this? And you just know that there's a mess being made or something's gone wrong. You're like, 
quiet. Nobody says, I'm he. Jesus, verse 8, Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way. Notice that. Don't miss that. The Lord Jesus Christ, who's the, the thief? He's talking about his disciples. He knows what's going to happen now. He knows exactly that there is some trouble coming and he wants to protect them, just like a good shepherd would protect his sheep. Verse 9, that the saying might be fulfilled which, which he spake, of them which thou gavest me have I lost none. You know, when, when Jesus says to the Lord, I've lost none, I'm looking after them. Christ Jesus did not come for himself, folks. He came for the nation of Israel. He came to save those who would trust and believe in him. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off the right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Does that sound like a coward to you? Then said Jesus unto Peter, put up my sword into thy sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Then the band and the captain and officers of Jews took Jesus and bound him. Now think of that. So here, they take Jesus. Peter's ready. He's ready with that sword. He's with, I'm, I'm here. To, I told you, Lord. I'm going to defend you, Lord. I told you. I'm willing to die with you, Lord. And the Lord says, no, 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 no. Put the sword away. And I believe it's there where Peter starts to think. And now? What's happening? I mean, the scriptures don't narrate that, but. Just think about what is actually happening there. Go with me. Now, I have not put this reading in, but last night in going through this again, uh, I thought, let me just share this with you. Luke chapter 22. Um, Luke chapter 22. Let's just go to Luke 22 quickly. Um, I just want to add this in. You can make a note and write it down and go and look at this scripture again. Luke 22, verse 31. I don't want us to miss this. Remember, I've said to you before, if you want to get the whole picture, just have a, you know, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, not all the, uh, the, the gospel accounts always give a uh, everything in. Some, uh, sometimes you'll only have in two of the gospel accounts or whatever, but go and find them and read them. Luke 22, verse 31. And the Lord said, now, Simon, Simon, that's Peter. Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Now, in the English, in the Old English, in the King James Version here, when it's you, he's talking plural. It's you, the group. So, see, Simon, Simon, who is the leader of the 12, we know, um, he says, Satan has desired to have you. That's the group that you may sift you. That's the group, divide you. But I notice, but I have prayed for thee. So, God, the Lord Jesus Christ talked to Peter, you know, I prayed for thee. Notice that thy faith fail not. Why? Because he knows that Peter's going to deny him. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So the Lord Jesus Christ knows Peter's going to deny him, right? And he knows that Peter's going to be in confusion. And that it, I believe, once again, as I say, it's not because Peter was a coward. There was, Peter was confused. He, he didn't understand what was happening, either through lack of understanding what was happening in the scriptures, or we hadn't heard clearly what the Lord Jesus Christ was saying, and I believe that is part of the problem. My wife sometimes tells me that. Gentlemen, how often are you told? You're not listening. That is a problem we as men have. We want to just give the answer. Most of us want to give the answer before we've heard the whole story. Gentlemen, I speak to myself as much as any other man here. Let the lady speak. Let's listen. Okay. By the way, that's a better. I just put the stick right in there. Right. Verse 33. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready, notice, to go with thee both into prison and to death. That's what Luke recalled. And he said unto him, when I sent you without, now notice carefully now, when I sent you without person script, the Lord Jesus, in, he says, you go out, you're not going to take any money, you're not going to take any food, you're not even going to have a change of clothing, you're going to be looked after. He says, when I sent you without person script and shoes, they had shoes, but they were told to only take one pair. When I sent you with it, lacked anything. And they said, nothing. 
because that's what the Lord said. But now notice, Jesus Christ knows something is changing now. Then said he unto them, but now, but now, oh, he that hath a purse, let him take it. In other words, you're going to have to take some money with you. Likewise, he stripped. That's a bag where you would take, you know, your, I'll use Dr. Gonto's punch course, you know, your, your food and stuff that you're going to take and, and, and whatever have you. And he that has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. So up until that point in time, the Lord had said, you know, don't take it. Now the Lord's saying, go and get one. Notice verse 37. For I say unto you that that this, that it is written, must ye be accomplished in, in me. He was reckoned among the transgressors for this concerning me. And they said, concerning me, have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. Now we know by deduction who had one of the, who had one of the swords. Peter, right? We don't know which disciple had the other one. But think about this. Here's another reason why I don't believe Peter was a coward. He draws the sword when they come to take the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows there's only another guy to protect him. Only one. They don't all have, so he's not standing there saying, come on, boys, let's go. He, he draws that sword out. Man, he's like on fire and he's going to defend the Lord. And he knows at the, at the very most, there's only one other guy, and we don't know who, the, the Bible doesn't say who the disciple was that had that sword. There's only one other guy to come and help. And, and it's clear that there were a whole group. So my question to you is, is that a coward that would do that? No. But here's the thing. When the Lord tells him to put away his sword and to leave it, that's the issue. Um, it's just something in Ezekiel that I want to just show you here. Ezekiel 21. This is another scripture I didn't put in, but as I was studying through this last night, again, preparation. Um, it, it, now, I don't want to go through the whole thing about Ezekiel and the prophecies and so forth, but I just want to get you... You to see this thing about the sword and the sheep. Ezekiel, Ezekiel and 21 verse 4 says, Seeing then that I will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked, thereof shall my sword go forth out of his sheep against all flesh from the south to the north. Verse 5, that all flesh may know that I, the Lord, have drawn my sword out of his sheep, and I will not return any more. If you read through that, you're talking about the sword. It's the sword, when the sword comes out of sheep, it's it's not like, listen, you know, I'm holding it, you know, or, or if you, you're going, to, I'm just, it's, it's out. I'm ready to go. I mean, Peter, he draws that sword and he swishes it towards the guy and he cuts off the right ear. The right ear. Well, how's that? Well, Peter was, Peter was aiming for the guy's neck. What did the guy do? What did he, because if you swish at someone, and he duck and chip, off goes his ear and the Lord just says, Hold on, Peter. He picks it up and he picks it up. And Peter's like, now what? I said I was going to defend you, Lord. Now you're telling me no. Go with me to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Matthew 26, 31. Matthew 26, 51. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword. And struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. That's talking about using violence there. That's not talking about, you know, it's not talking about not going to war or not being in, in a, you know, defending your country and that kind of thing. It's living with violence. We know that. I mean, in our country, we have so much violence going on and so forth and all around the world. Verse 53, thinkest thou that I cannot now, now notice what, think about this. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled? Thus it must be. So the Lord says to Peter, put away your sword, Peter. Don't you think I can call, you know, you think you're going to defend me? 
I'm just trying to say, just think about the mindset of Peter and what is going on. And he's not, he doesn't have the full understanding of the scriptures that you and I have today. And we are so blessed and privileged to be able to look at the entire word of God and see this. And if we study God's word, have the plan of God revealed to us. Peter is there, and I believe Peter's emotions um, got the better of him, and Peter was, he was downhearted, if I could put it to that way. He, he really just thought, okay, well, this is it. So now, with that in mind, let's go and see what happens. Matthew 26, verse 58, now, just go down a little bit. But Peter followed him afar. Now, they've arrested the Christ, they've taken him. By the way, this is way into the night. This is an illegal arrest. It's they're taking him to the high priest, which is something the scriptures say you should not do. Any, any court or anything that is done must be done in daylight hours. These guys are just scheming and conniving. But Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace. Notice the high priest didn't have just a little home. He had a palace. And went in and sat with the servants to see the end. So there's Peter now. He, he, he's following. He doesn't know what's happening. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council saw false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. Now the law demanded that you have at least what? Two witnesses. Two or three witnesses. But the thing is, it's not just having two witnesses. It's having two witnesses that agree. Notice what's happening here. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council saw false witnesses against Jesus. They weren't looking for the truth. They were looking for a reason to condemn him, to put him to death, but found none. There were lots of witnesses. If you read the accounts, there were many people that came and said, oh, this and this, but none of them agreed. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two credible witnesses who could attest to what was happening. No, what does the scripture say? Two False witnesses who just happened to, whether they got together before and said, we're going to go and say this or whatever. And these two witnesses come and they're the false witnesses. And said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. That's not what the Lord Jesus Christ said. The scriptures are clear. He was talking about himself. And the high priest arose and said unto him, answer us thou nothing. What is it which thou, these witnesses against thee? But Jesus held his is. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Now hold on a minute. Just think of, I adjure thee by the living God. Well, who was right before them? Was the living God not right before them? Was the word of God, the word in the flesh, not right before them? And they were blinded by what? They were blinded by their own religion, by their own self-centeredness jesus said unto them thou hast said nevertheless i say unto you hereafter shall ye see them the son of man sitting on the right hand of the power and coming in the clouds of heaven then the high priest rent his clothes now by the way it was illegal for the high priest to rent his clothes and tear his clothes so the high priest breaks the law himself he hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now we have heard this blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Then did they spit in his face and buffet him, and others smote him with the palm of their hand. Now, notice Peter is taking note of all of these things, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee. Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him. Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. And he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. I don't know what you're talking about. What are you talking about? And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath. I do not know this man. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art one of them. For thy speech bereath thee. Well, you know, it's it's one of those things where Peter, your speech, you, your speech tells us that that you are you are a Galilean. We know we know who you are. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man, and immediately the cock 
see. And Peter remembered, now notice, Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. So the, yeah, Peter is in confusion. He doesn't know what's happening. And because of that, he's, he's, not, he's not coming to a point in saying, well, you know what? I know that the scriptures say that the Lord needs to be arrested. And then this is what's going to happen. And then the scriptures are clear that this is going to take place. And that's going to happen. He doesn't know what's happening. All he knows is I stood for this man. I was willing to defend him. He said to me, no, now it is. So what, is, what now? The sheep have been scattered. But what did the Lord say to Peter? When you come to an understanding of what has happened, Peter, you're going to guide those that are, that are following you. And that's exactly what we see happening eventually. Go with me to Mark chapter 14 quickly. Mark chapter 14. Mark 14 verse 66. Here's another account. Verse 66. And as Peter was beneath in the palace, there came cometh one of the maids and the high priest. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked upon him and said, And thou also wast with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied, saying, I know not, neither understand I what thou sayest. And he went out into the porch and the cock crew. And the maid saw him again and began to say to them and stood by, this is one of them. And he denied it again. And a little after they that stood by said again to Peter, surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean, and thy spake, their speech agreeeth there unto you. In other words, listen, we, we know who you are from your speech. But he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man of whom you speak. And the second time the cock crew, and Peter called to mind the word of Jesus that said, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought thereon, he wept. Now, Mark brings an account here, brings an understanding, where, which is not recorded in, in, in the other Gospels, where in actual fact, the cock crew twice before Peter denied the Lord Jesus Christ thrice. Now, think about that. Now, it was around about three o'clock, three, four o'clock in the morning when this cock crows. And you think, what on earth is this guy doing crowing at that time in the morning? Well, I can tell you now, if you've, if you've lived on a farm or if you've lived anywhere where, where your folks have uh, uh, roosters in our area, we've got some folks that live fair way away from us and they've got roosters and boy oh boy if I, sometimes if i get up and you know four o'clock in the morning to let the dogs out or whatever you and then you just want to like, what is the guy doing but notice that the cock crows twice think about that the lord knows that so the first time peter denies the lord the cock crows don't you think that's like a bit of a reminder think about what Peter so what, 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 and then denies the Lord again twice, and the cock goes a second time, and he goes out and he weeps bitterly. Psalm 118, verse 8 and 9 says, just go with me there quickly. Psalm 118, verse 8 and 9. Psalm 118, verse 8 and 9. By the way, did that Cock crow that I did sound okay. I mean, it's not the greatest of, uh, how shall we say, uh, sound effects, but nonetheless, that's the best you're going to get. I hope it's not me dreaming, crying in my sleep and I'm dreaming that I'm hearing it. Anyway, just to leave it a bit. Psalm 118, verse 8 and 9. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence, notice, in man. Where was Peter putting his confidence? Lord, I'm going to be there. I'm going to defend you. It is better to trust in the law than to put confidence in princes. Folks, we need to trust the word of God and know and understand if we're going to trust God's word, God's word is going to give us the answers we need to have. Now, if we deny that, we are going to be denied the peace and the confidence and the and the, the comfort that we can get through the scriptures if we don't trust that. And that's why we say to you over and over and over, it's got to be God's word that must do the work in you. Not my words, God's word. Go with me to John chapter 18. As we just wrap this up in terms of the denial, um, I just want you to get all the picture here. John chapter 18. John chapter 18, verse 15.
Here's, here's something that John brings in and says, and Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Right? And the other disciple there is John. He's writing about himself in the third person there. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. So think about that. Peter's out, out. John goes in. But Peter stood at the door without, then went out the other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art thou also one of the man, this man's disciples? He saith, I'm not. So now he denies, I'm not even a disciple. And the servants and the officers stood there, who had made a fire of the cold, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Then, now notice carefully. The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered and said, answered him, I spake openly to the world. I even taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort, and in secret I have said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me. What I had said unto them, behold, thou know what I said. Notice the, the high priest asked Jesus of his disciples. Jesus never said that there's two of them. Don't miss that. Christ just answered, he spoke about that, he kept the focus on himself. He, do you think the Lord Jesus, let me ask you this do you think the Lord knew John and Peter were there? Of course he did. What do we do when we get into trouble? Y'all, but it wasn't only me. The more people we can get into trouble with us, the, more, the better we feel. You know, like, we know we're not going to get out of this, so let's get more people. That's not what Jesus, Christ spoke, a focus was fully on what he needed to do. And when he had thus spoken, one of his officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answer us thou the high priest, sir. Jesus answered him, If I had spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest smite thou me? Jesus says, listen. When Paul writes to Timothy, he says he cannot deny himself. Christ didn't deny who he was, and his words were his words. He spoke the truth. And Ananias sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, Ananias was Caiaphas' father-in-law. Ananias was the high priest, and um, Caiaphas was the current sitting high priest. So Christ goes through two of these First of all, Ananias and then Caiaphas. And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said, therefore, unto him, art thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being the kinsman whose ear was cut off. Now notice something. Who cut off the ear of Malchus? Peter. And here's a guy that witnesses that event happening. He's a kinsman. He's, he's a relative of the guy whose ear was cut off. Say, did not I see thee in the garden with him? I mean, that's getting close. That's like witness account second to nothing. Peter then denied it again, and immediately the cock crew. Verse 20, had then led they Jesus from Caiaphas into the hall of judgment. And it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but they might eat the Passover. Now look at what's happening. They're so concerned about themselves being able to partake of the Passover that they don't want to go into the judgment hall because it's not permitted for them to do that because otherwise they're going to be defiled in terms of them taking the Passover. Just think about what's happening. And who was Christ? We've looked at that, the Passover lamb. So all of these things are happening. So I, I just want to put it to you and say to you, it is my belief and my understanding that Peter was confused. He didn't have either because of lack of his um, listening or whatever the case may be. He did not have all the information and he was acting and reacting on that. He was not relying on the, on the information that was given to him by Christ. Where the Lord Jesus Christ said, this is what I'm going to do. If you look into the gospel accounts, Peter says, no ways, Lord. Can't be. That's not, that, that, that's not the plan. But what happens with Peter after? Go with me to Acts chapter 3. Now, we jump right ahead. The Lord Jesus Christ has been taken, violently beaten, mistreated, placed on the cross, 
Cain's there. We've looked at that for the last number of weeks. He dies on that cross. His soul is made an offering for your sin, my sin, for the sin of the world. His soul is made an offering. He completes the work. We've looked at that in the mini series. We talked about it is finished. He does everything necessary. He rises. He accomplishes everything that the scriptures say he needs to accomplish. And then he ascends 40 days later. He ascends into heaven. Now, do you think Peter has got all the information that he needs? And do you think Peter is now listening intently? Yes. Look what he says in Acts chapter 3, verse 12. Verse 1 of Acts chapter 3 says, Peter and John went together into the temple. By the way, I find that fascinating because who was with Peter when, when the Lord was being uh, um, judged? It was John. Can you imagine the discussions that these guys have had? The Lord's now gone into heaven and Peter and John, but where do they go? They go off, went together to the temple at the hour of prayer. This is not two guys that are denying who the Lord is now. Peter's come to an understanding. He's the leader of the 12. They're going to, um, to the temple to pray and then they heal. And I don't want to go through all the scripture there. They heal the guy that is lame. By the way, that's the shadow and type of the lameness of the, the nation of Israel, a nation that needed to be healed. If you, you look at it, all of the healing things that take, take place, it's got to do with teaching doctrine. But pick it up on verse 12. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man walk? Peter has come to an origin and understanding now. It's not him. It's not me, Lord, I'm going to go out and do this. It's me relying on what Christ has done. It's Peter relying on what the Lord has told him to do. Verse 13, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. Does that sound like someone who is a coward? Peter is not, boy, oh boy, he's letting them have it. And guess what? He's not using his physical sword anymore. What's he using? Think about it. He's using the sword of God, which is what? The word. He's speaking what the people need to hear. The word that God wants these folks to hear. Verse 15, and kill the prince of life whom God has raised up from the dead, whereof ye are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong. It's not us doing this. This is the power of Almighty God, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot not that through ignorance he did it, as did also your rulers. Notice, through ignorance, or well, Peter, Peter had a bit of ignorance in terms of knowing what God was accomplishing through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. What did Jesus say to Peter, which we read earlier? Peter, but when you get converted, when you come to that understanding, when you, what are you going to do? Go and lead. And that's exactly what Peter's doing. Peter says in verse 19, repent ye therefore and be converted. That word repent, change your mind. Change your mind of who you believe Jesus Christ is. Do you think Peter changed his mind? Do you think he understood what was happening? Absolutely. And be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Peter knows the Lord's coming back. And guess what? He's coming with the sword of wrath. Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God had spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Folks, I want to put it to you and say that Peter was disheartened. He was confused. He did not understand what was happening. But when all things were revealed to him and he understood, you know what he did? He stood firm on the truth of God's word. He stood firm on what God Almighty wanted him to do. And he did not waver to the very point of being persecuted. Now, here's the thing. I believe that many Christians today are disheartened because they have a lack of understanding of the scripture. 
They think they know, but when they face issues and challenges, it's those issues and challenges that draw them to a place of emotional turmoil and they get to a place where they, they cannot cope because they don't, they don't understand, but surely this shouldn't be happening or shouldn't this be happening or shouldn't God be doing this, that or the next thing. And it's because of a lack of understanding of scripture that people, I believe, and I'm not talking about lost folks now, I'm talking about Christians. Christians are battling with life. And if we are going to refrain from studying the scriptures, we are going to be like Peter. We are going to be thinking, I'm doing this, Lord. I'm doing this for you. I'm for you, Jesus. Do you know what? It's not about us for Jesus. It's about Christ for us. It's about the life of Christ living in and through us. It's about us trusting the word of God. It's about us having God's word live within us and work within us. Let me show you this. Colossians 3. Colossians 3. This is what Paul's talking about. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. This is what I want to leave you with. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Colossians 3, 12. Paul writes to the church in Colossians, and he says, Put on therefore as the elect of God. He's talking to saved folks here. As the elect, the elect of the moment you trust the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection on the cross at Calvary for your salvation, become part of the elect. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies. That's an, this word here it can refer to, it's not referring in this particular instance into your internal organs, it's referring to the very depth. You know, you know, you know when you feel sadness, do you? You know, it's, it's, it's gut-wrenching, right? And so he says, put on, the, in the very depth of your inner man, put on mercies, of kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, meekness. That's the ability to forbear even to turmoil. Long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. Notice, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, that's any, that's, folks, that's whether you have a quarrel against a saved or a lost person, but, Particularly, how we, we need to heed this when it comes to the church, the body of Christ. How do we act with one another? And how do we, what do we portray to the world? If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so do you also. So also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Now, what do we put? In other words, when you've got the word of God working in you, when you understand what is happening, put on charity. Show charity. Charity is love in action. Notice, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Verse 16, here's the word, verse that I want, want you to pay particular attention to. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It's in your very inner man. Let it take up reason. How is it going to dwell? The only way it's going to dwell if it becomes part of your life, part of your being, part of everything that you are. By reading it, believing it, studying it, and trusting it. Dwell in you richly. Notice, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We don't get our doctrine out of songs and hymns, but the songs and hymns reinforce the doctrine of the word. So we sing the songs. You know when you think of the song, and there's some words in the song. That song just means so much to me. And it's a song that reminds you of some scripture. And you're going through the challenges and you've got that song. The Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, notice, you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Allowing the word of God to dwell in you richly. To take up residence, to guide you, to help you. Now, I was chatting with some folks before the service, and we were, I was debating whether I'm going to tell you the story that I want to tell you, because what I find sometimes is I tell you a story to illustrate what I'm telling you, and then you remember just the story. Okay? So, I want to tell you the story, but I don't want you to just talk about the story, okay? You okay? Yes? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> You take the scripture. Anyway, but it illustrates what I'm trying to say to you. Now, most of you know that I did my national service and I was in the uh, medical 
four, and I did my national service training in one military hospital in intensive care. And they would literally drill us. We would run drill upon drill upon drill. And as the Kazakhs would come in, we, we, would, we would have to know the emergency trolley like the back of our hand. We had to be literally blindfolded and be able to take anything off that trolley if we were asked to do. Because in an emergency situation, if the doctor called out, atropine or whatever you wanted, you, you couldn't be, uh, have I said no, yeah, like that, let me just check the index. You needed to know exactly what was happening at that point in time. You needed to know that. And we ran drill upon drill upon drill. To this point, 30 years later, I can just close my eyes and I can see that emergency trolley before. Anyway, so what happens is it becomes part of you, right? Okay, maybe you weren't there, but I'm just telling you, that, that's what it is. So here's the thing. Thursday afternoon, I'm out running with a couple of folks. You know what happened Thursday afternoon, right? A storm came out of nowhere, literally nowhere. And we were on the William Marple, and as we were running, we were literally getting blown from side to side. And, and we, now we're debating, do we turn around and go back? The problem is we're halfway. We're halfway to where we need to go. So we'll, we say, okay, well, let's just carry on because we're going to have the wind at our backs. How nice is that, man? And one time I thought, thank you, Lord, for pulling the long legs. You know? so, so off we go. But what happened is, halfway down William Market, there's this massive spot. And I turn around, and it's a JoJo tank that has now come flying and smashes into a car and hits the guy behind him. Knocks him flying. He is as unconscious as anything. He's gone. I turn around. And here's the thing. The friend, someone I care very deeply for, my emotion, I'm now in a state of, this is someone I care for. And I'm thinking, geez, is this guy going to be okay? Right? So that immediate reaction was a reaction of, but within a few seconds, guess what happened? In kicks in my turn. And I become so totally focused on this guy. I'm down there, I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm not even fully conscious. I'm no, I'm checking airways, I'm checking heart, I'm putting in recovery position, I'm checking, I'm talking, I'm getting him to respond. I'm call an ambulance, do this and this and this, give me a phone, da, 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 da. and I and I'm I'm taking control. Why? Because my training kicked in. 30 years later. So what do I do? Now, understand, I've thought through this. You know, oh, come on. I have thought through this because when you're out there, we don't carry cell phones and stuff because just from a safety perspective, you know, you should maybe have it. You know, you know what I'm talking about. What use does a cell phone if it gets stolen, right? So I know the ambulance is on the way. Another lady stops and she says she's a medical doctor. Oh boy, thank you. How can she help? And I tell her what's the story. And she said, okay, let's just keep doing this. Then I say to her, do you have a phone? And guess what? Any guess? I phone my wife. Because I know my wife has got the number of contacts of the folks that I run with. Phone her. Strange number. She answers. And I said, and I just quickly kill her. This is what's happened. Da, 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 da. Get all of, and you know, you guys have seen that clip where the guy says, phone Joss, phone whatever, whatever. Well, this was phone Bruce and Paul F. McEwen. They know what to do. <laughs> and I put the phone, and after that, I knew. Well, cut a long story short, eventually, Paul Ed arrives and so forth, and we're getting this whole thing sorted, and, and, and we get the guy to the hospital, and I'm so grateful and so thankful that he's okay. He's sore, bruised, but he's, he's okay. Now, I tell you the story. When you see me, he says, that's a very interesting story. I want you to know what about the scriptures I've told you. But I'm telling you the story to illustrate this. If you allow the word of God to dwell in you richly through your continued study of the word of God, you know what's going to happen when you face a crisis? You're going to have your emotion. You're going to have your challenges. But guess what you're going to have also? You're going to have scripture to hang your mind's thoughts on. That you can focus on the scripture. That you can know, ah, this is not, yes, I've got my human emotion. Yes, I've got the challenges. But it's there. Okay? So that's why I tell you the story. I, like I say to you, emotion. When I, from an emotional perspective, listen, if I'm dealing with someone that is not, I'm not connected to, it's, it's way easier to deal with the situation, right? I can bring a calmness up. But when it's someone you really get close to, you know what I'm talking about. 
So folks, I want to say to you, Peter was not a coward. He was in confusion. But when he came to fully understand what Christ had accomplished on the cross, boy, oh boy, he stood for it firmly. And if you know and understand what God has done through his word and is doing through his word, working effectually in you, you know what's going to happen when you face the challenges of life? You're going to have an answer to hold and to guide you. You know what you're going to be able to do? You're going to be able to help the person around you. Amen? Okay. All right. I'm going to hear about this story now. Father God, we give you thanks and praise for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your word. And Lord, my prayer would be that your word would effectually work in and through every believer that reads it, believes it, and trusts it. Lord, we know that we, we have so many things to be thankful for, so many blessings. And yet we know that there are so many folks facing so many different challenges. We pray that as we continue to study your word, as we teach your word, as we read your word, believe your word, trust your word, that your word will bring us to a place of inner calmness, inner strength, that we can be a guide and a help, that, that a wife can be a, a help to a husband who is going through a challenging time, that a husband can be there for his wife, for his children, and vice versa. versa. Grandparents can be there for their grandchildren and so forth. Friends and family can be there for one another because we're trusting your word to give us that inner strength. Help us to not be like Peter in confusion because we haven't taken the time or the trouble to read and to study your word and to get it dwelling within us. Help us be those that can be secure even in the storms of life. We give you thanks and praise in and through Christ Jesus. Amen.